Good morning, friends. We're on chapter two, part three. The railroad lines we followed were there because that's where the settler roads had been. And the settler roads were there because that's where the Indian trails had been. And the Indian trails were there because 250 million years ago, the Juniata River had sawed her way through the shale and limestone strata of that country, faster than tectonic plates could lift them up. Harder stone, such as granite, diverts rivers and creates barriers that people generally have to go around. The Juniata offered a way through the Allegheny Front that had no viable alternatives for hundreds of miles. The southern options, the southern option went up the Potomac River and through the mountains of West Virginia. The northern option went by canal from upstate New York to Lake Erie. The United States of the early 1800s, when the first railroads were built, had a relatively small population and very little capital. In order to compete with Europe, the federal government faced the prospect of spending a huge amount of money on infrastructure. Otherwise, the new democracy would remain an economic backwater that was fatally divided between a thriving East Coast, East Coast and an inaccessible interior. Transporting a bushel of wheat 300 miles from Pittsburgh to Philadelphia cost more than the wheat was worth at market, and America's rugged geography was something that private enterprise couldn't hope to conquer on its own. To solve the problem, America's Swiss-born Treasury Secretary, Albert Gallatin, proposed a massive infrastructure plan that would subsidize a network of roads and canals linking cities like Baltimore and Philadelphia with the Ohio, Ohio River Valley. Although the plan was not passed, most of the projects Gallatin proposed in 1808 were eventually built, including a crucial rail and canal route up the Juniata. America's wealth and hegemony can be traced in part to Gallatin's efforts to overcome his new country's aversion to federal investment and espouse a grander vision. A statue of Gallatin stands at the northern entrance of the Treasury Building in Washington, D.C. Twenty years after Gallatin's proposal, the inaugural spadeful of earth for a subsidized national railroad was turned by a man named Charles Carroll who was the last surviving signatory of the Degl Declaration of Independence. Carroll claimed to be prouder of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad than the historic document he signed, believing that a national transportation system coupled with America's vast resources and almost unlimited immigrant and slave labor <laughs> could create the most powerful country on earth. Hey, he was right. But that vision required both a massive expansion of government as well as the wholesale violation of property rights. It, is also require, it also required overlooking the moral outrage of slavery, which was an economic asset that the federal government was not yet willing to question. Aye. Railroads require a huge amount of land, and to build a national system, the government had to seize and redistribute an area equivalent to the entire state of South Carolina, the land was seized under the principle of eminent domain, which holds that the government can force the sale of private property if it is overwhelmingly in the public interest. Two irre irreconcilable forms of freedom were at stake. A nation's freedom to maximize its own prosperity and an individual's freedom to own and control land. Prosperity won. In the words of an 1837 court case named Bloodgood v. Mohawk, it was the railroad's ability to annihilate distance that made it indispensable to the public good and therefore unstoppable in court. The building of America's railroads was the largest and most ambitious public works project of the industrial era and consumed men almost as fast as it did steel and timber. Railroad work relied on high explosives to blow holes through inconvenient geography and was so dangerous that slave, over, slave owners often refused to contract out their slaves because they didn't want to lose them. Workers throughout the rest of the country and much of the South were often Irish and Chinese immigrants who arrived in America so poor that railroad companies felt free to essentially work them to death. Roughly 1,200 men died working on the Transcontinental Railroad, for example, though the exact number is not known because employees didn't even bother keeping careful records. Like warfare, building a railroad is crushingly monotonous when it isn't absolutely deadly. First, survivors staked out routes that made huge detours around anything they couldn't blast through. Timber fallers then cleared first-growth forest with axes and cross-cut saws and blew massive stumps out of the ground with dynamite. Only then could an army of laborers start leveling the track bed. When the laborers were done, cross ties and rails were laid out on top 
on the top ballast, and the whole thing was pinned down by spikers, who counted three strokes to the spike, ten spikes to the rail, and four hundred rails to the mile. A good crew could lay a mile of track a day, except in the mountains, where thousands of men could be stalled in the same place for months. Prostitutes, con men, gamblers, and murderers poured into these work camps as soon as they were established. The frontier was the principal area of single male brutality, observes historian David Courtright, who has studied violence in all male groups. The surplus of young men, widespread bachelorhood, sensitivity about honor, racial hostility, heavy drinking, religious indifference, group indulgence in vice, ubiquitous armament, and inadequate law enforcement were concentrated on the frontier. Railroad towns and other male-dominated communities had mortality rates that rivaled battlefields, and that did not change until women began to migrate westward and have children. The railroad town of Laramie, Wyoming, had so many murders that the town undertaker often just carted the bodies into the desert and dumped them. Benton, Wyoming, lost 7% of its population to murder in the first two months of its existence. As dangerous as railroad work was, a Union Pacific employee was four times more likely to die after hours in towns like Benton and Laramie than the job itself. The dangers didn't end after the railroad, railroads were built. Early steam engines were considered so risky that the president of the Erie Railroad insisted on doing the inaugural, inaugural run entirely alone in case there was an accident. Railroad technology was brand new, and there were dangers associated with it that no engineer or actuary could possibly think up. What could, who could have imagined a swarm of grasshoppers so thick that their crushed bodies could derail trains in Pennsylvania in 1836? How could a 23-year-old railro railroad worker named Edgar Herndon have known that a frog, a mechanical track switch, would grab his foot and not let go until a train ran over him in, in 1873? And when O.M. Wilmot leaned out the window of his locomotive while driving over a Vermont bridge in 1894, why would he worry about clearances that were so tight a post would take off his head? The workers usually died individually, but passengers often died by the train load. Eighty-nine people lost their lives when an iron trestle failed in its entirety, a so-called square fall, and dropped a whole train into a gorge near Ashtab Ashtabula, Ohio, in 1876. Many people who survived the fall died in fires that were ignited by lanterns and coal stoves in the wreckage. Eighty-eight people drowned in their own compartments when a trestle failed and shunted their train into a flooded creek outside Eden, Colorado, in 1904. These tragedies could have been prevented by better track maintenance. Harder to guard against were the complex interactions of train, trains, signals, and bad timing. In 1905, a mile-long freight train moving only six miles an hour, break to avoid a collision in the Harrisburg yards and pitch some of its box boxcars onto another track. Unfortunately, only one of those cars was packed with dynamite, which was detonated by a passenger train that just happened to pass at that moment. Twenty-three people were killed and more than one hundred injured. Some of the older survivors must have thought they were back in the battlefields of Antietam and Gettysburg. Antietam. Industrial carnage was new to society, and civilians were not prepared for it. In fact, the first medical diagnosis for psychological trauma was called railroad spine because it was so closely associated with the mass casualties of railroad accidents. In 1903, the Duquesne Limited was running at 60 miles an hour outside Connellsville, Pennsylvania, when she hit a load of timber that had fallen off the freight train that preceded her. It was nighttime, and the timber was strewn along a curve, so the engineer had no chance to throw the brakes. The baggage car derailed and was hurled into the Yewegeny River. The smoking car, packed with men who had come forward from the passenger cars, flipped and landed on the engine. The impact cracked the boiler, which was pressurized to 300 pounds per square inch, and escaping steam cooked the passengers alive. Since very few women smoked, they were mostly in Pullman cars at the rear and could hear their husbands screaming as they died. The force of the collision demolished the engine, ripped almost every car off its trucks, threw a 7,000-gallon water tank entirely over the train, and killed 78 people. Thanks. Have a good day, friends.